Manhattan 400 years ago was a complete ecological system. It had bears, it had people, it had whales, it had porpoises, it had river otters. There he is, Bronx Coyote, the most southern coyote in the Bronx right here. This is pretty exciting, that's a great shot. New York's reinvention should begin with finding out about and understanding its natural history. Some answers lie behind the scenes at the Bronx Zoo. The Bronx Zoo is the refuge of Eric Sanderson, a scientist who has devoted his life to rebuilding the natural history of Manhattan, a Lenape name for Island of Many Hills. Why did the pioneers of New York City settle here at the water's edge 400 years ago? Quite simply, because it was a natural paradise. Sanderson had that intuition before he came up with the proof. I happened to be in a, a large bookstore downtown, and I saw this map um, from 200 years ago called the British Headquarters map. And it showed all of the original streams and hills of Manhattan. Well, so I, I tried to imagine if I was an ecologist and I was riding on Henry Hudson's ship, what might I have seen in Manhattan? And what I, what I would have seen is this, is this amazing deep water harbor and this long, thin, wooded island that was Manhattan Island, uh, covered with forest and fringed with beaches, with sparkling streams coming down to the shoreline. Manhattan 400 years ago was a complete ecological system. It had bears, it had people, it had whales, it had porpoises, it had river otters. It had something that we don't have anywhere in the world today, which is a complete ecological system with all the parts working together to satisfy each other and be part of the ecology of the place. The modern city raised Manhattan's 35 hills to the ground then stretched out over the sea, over its own rubble. It offered itself up to flooding, forgetting its geography at the risk of ending its history. It was in the midst of such wealth that pioneers laid the foundations of the global city. But how, in just a few centuries, were these virtually virgin forests, this wild natural landscape, turned into a forest of glass and concrete? First, they had to eliminate the inhabitants, the Lenape Indians. The natural resources were so abundant that they knew neither hierarchy nor mistrust. They taught nature and hunting techniques to the settlers who then killed them. The pioneers then began intensively hunting beavers. A single boat could carry up to 7,000 pelts to Holland, a natural treasure that helped the city in its rise. Then the settlers had an extraordinary idea to turn Manhattan, the island with 35 hills, into a geometrical shape. To deny nature, to crush it in order to develop the city in nothing but the city, according to a grid with every last piece chopped up and sold. One of the distinctive characteristics of New York is its grid, what we would call a waffle iron. This grid was so important because it was imposing man on nature. It was saying that with all these trees and hills and streams, we're gonna to try to make it flat, and we're gonna develop it. In order to develop it, we've gotta lay out streets. And in order to sell the property, because New York was always about making money, we will create streets exactly 200 feet apart. There is an irony here in the sense that nature created the conditions for New York to exist, and then New York, in some sense, in its physical growth, turns against nature to build up all these buildings and tries to forget about it. 150 years later, the famous grid has left its mark on New York like a waffle iron. The forests seem to have given up the ghost, and the city reigns supreme. So what's left of nature? 
how might it still count in the fate of the Big Apple? David Roseanne is a pioneer of urban ecology, teacher at Cornell University, an ornithologist. He's one of those who opens nature up to New Yorkers. To him, nature is still alive and kicking. Just look into the air. Each year, the birds return in their thousands, and each year, they pay the price. New York is built right in the middle of a migration route. Oh dear. This bird is, is called a scarlet tanager. It's a South American bird that flies north every spring. The sad thing is you really have to imagine what these birds are going through. Just surviving uh, in the natural environment, in the wilderness, in the rainforest where they spend the winter, um, in the temperate forest where they breed, trying to evade predators, trying to raise their young, flying thousands and thousands of kilometers to get this far north and thousands and thousands of kilometers to fly south again and then slamming into a building. And so this is a, you know, this is my favorite bird. So it's to find a dead one sucks. Fucking windows. The New York City was built in the middle of this flyway. And most of the buildings around here have reflective uh, glass, and the birds, the migratory birds at least, the local birds, the starlings, the pigeons, the house sparrows, they figure that out. But the migratory birds really can't perceive glass as such, and they see a reflection of a tree behind them in the window that they're flying into as a tree that they could potentially land on. And before you know it, before they know it, they hit the glass, they're dead. In spring and in autumn, the radars ping like crazy revealing a million passing migrants in the New York City skies. Fooled by the lights or the reflections, 90,000 birds die on the skyscrapers. Nowadays, the buildings are clad in anti-glare glass, and the most powerful city in the world dims its lights several nights a year. The giant decoy is turned off to let a few flights of birds passed from Amazonia, from Canada, and from the dawn of time. The migratory birds make a pit stop in a wild oasis in the heart of New York. Rarely has the coexistence of wildlife in the city been as precarious as here at Jamaica Bay. On the one side, JFK Airport, with its 1,000 daily takeoffs and landings. On the other, hundreds of thousands of migratory birds, which come and go in the only urban national park in the USA. Between the two stands a question mark. How could an advanced society have built an airport smack in the middle of a migration route? Sky sharing is a tricky business, and the number of crashes increases. Jamaica Bay is a nightmare. Jamaica Bay is a miracle. The park is under recurring threat of an airport extension, each time NGOs and citizens foil the plans. Biologist Don Reapy has fought all of these battles. Don Reapy is the temple guardian of Jamaica Bay, a temple where between two passing jets, a miracle takes place. The return of birds of prey the settling of a colony of frightened owls, the spectacle of dancing seagulls. Once a year, when the horseshoe crabs arrive, Don Reapy reconnects with the primitive force of this swamp. This is a living dinosaur. <laughs> it has not changed its basic shape in 300 million years. It is an ancient primitive animal, a beautiful design, very important ecologically and medically. Yeah. You know, the copper-based blood is used to detect impurities in, in our, our blood, you know, if we're getting a transfusion or a vaccine. Nest in the sand at the high tide. And then all the shorebirds feed on the eggs. Mm -hmm. They feed, feed, feed for maybe two weeks. 
and they double their weight. And they need that fuel to go north to the breeding grounds. If they don't get it, population declines. So this, is, this, has, this is of international importance? International importance, ecological importance. Besides the historical animals which have New York in their genes, other creatures are arriving in the city. By following the railroad tracks, by swimming up the rivers and canals, by working their way across golf courses and cemeteries, a timid animal bursts in the heart of Manhattan. Breaking news. The it wasn't a big bad wolf that park goers were buzzing about, but rather a not so small coyote. First spotted on Sunday, the male canine eluded capture for days as some cops loaded tranquilizer guns. It's going down, it's going down. But the 35 pound male wasn't having it. He jumped an eight foot fence. While pondering the question of where Hal came from, they can tell you where he is going now, back into the wild. In Central Park, Gary Anthony Ramsey, New York One. For biologist Mark Weckel, the arrival of the coyote is a sign. No longer is the city on one side and wild animals on the other. Ecosystems are interlaced. Anything is possible. Honestly, most people don't even realize there are coyotes in New York City. I've talked to a lot of people who are actually really curious about the idea that a fairly large wild animal could actually find itself home in, you know, well, <laughs> this urban mess and that they've seemed to be coming in as fast as they are. 10 years ago, when I started my work in um, the city parks, there were no coyotes. And now we're talking about them expanding and moving into Queens. District after district, the coyote is colonizing Gotham City. He comes from far away, in the northern states, where he interbred with wolves before taking on New York. We have a male and a couple female turkeys back here, too. It's from here, in anonymous Bronx Park, that coyotes plot their conquest of the city. All right, so this camera, this one has been up for uh, a month. So this is the easy part of the job. All we got to do is take one of these cards back to the laptop and try to see what uh, came by in the last month. There he is, Bronx Coyote, the most southern coyote in the Bronx right here. This is pretty exciting. That's a great shot. There's a scientific reason for doing this study on the Gotham Coyote, the New York City Coyote. Often a scientist, a conservation biologist, is retrospectively trying to figure out, well, how did this big mammal or this bird get to this new place? And they have to figure it out after the fact, after it already got there. And here we have this unique period in history where the coyote is on an edge. It's moving its population forward. And that forward is into New York City, into Long Island. So in real time, we can figure out how this animal adapts to urban landscapes. And then being that it's New York City, we have to lock it. The coyotes have reproduced at the junction of two freeways and an airport. They are telling New Yorkers between fear and fascination, the two extremes, the wilderness and the world of men, can share the same territory, the city. 